Okay, let's get started. Robert, you can tell us what we are. Thank you. The subject is the model of evolution provides a greater benefit for mankind than the model of creation. I think I'm going to change the subject. <clears throat> I want to thank Bill Jack for giving me a taped uh, preview of the debate, uh, a debate he conducted, uh, I don't know how long ago, did a very good job, and I know I'm at a disadvantage here, but I'm going to go ahead with it anyway. I think it's interesting we're debating an issue of science in the church. I'm a lawyer. I'm not a scientist. I know very little about evolution. I know more about, probably more about intelligent design uh, because it's a simpler concept. Um, I was born and raised as a Roman Catholic. I was an altar boy. I went to a Catholic grade school. I went to a Jesuit college. I took all the Jesuit courses, uh, the ologies, re theology, oncology, not oncology, that's a medical. <laughs> <laughs> Epistemology, uh, cosmology, all of the philo philosophy courses. And then I went to a Jesuit law school where they taught mostly law, not much uh, religion. I left the church because I just couldn't believe all the fables. I just couldn't believe that, I can't, I can't believe there is a God. I, I can't say I don't, I don't, I disbelieve it, I just don't know. I'm not hostile towards religion. I, people who believe in God, they're certainly entitled to believe in God, and maybe you're right, who, those of you who do, I don't know. But I just don't know. I can't believe in the Trinity. I can't believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, that Jesus was God, he came on earth and was murdered, and I just can't believe all that stuff. It just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Plus, to me, if there's a trinity, there's three gods. There's not one God. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to talk a little bit now about the, the Constitution. The founders of this country were very wise. Most, if not all, of them believed in God. They were deists. But they made sure to write a constitution that was secular. And why did they do that? They did that because they wanted people to be free to practice the religion of their choice. It was a gift. It allows, it keeps the government out of religion. It doesn't, it may, it, the government is not hostile to religion. The government has, can neither promote the religion nor discourage religion. The government just stays out of religion. It's a secular state and people are entitled to profess, to, to, to practice the faith they believe. The Constitution doesn't mention God except to say there shall be no religious test for public office, and then later on in the First Amendment, uh, Turk talking of establishments of religion are unconstitutional, and uh, the government cannot prohibit the free exercise of religion. And that is actually what has allowed so many religions to flourish in this country. And that's a problem with the Islamic world. You don't have any choice in the Islamic world. The government tells you that you're a Muslim. That's what you are. And you can't be anything else. You can't be a Christian. You can't be a, an atheist. You can't be an agnostic. You can't be a Buddhist. You have to be a Muslim. We don't live in that kind of a world. And I hope we never do. The government has no business in religion. I have to tell you, I was shocked when the Carter, uh, the, not the Carter administration, I'm really dating myself, when the, when the uh, Clinton administration attacked the compound in Waco, Texas. I didn't believe, uh, I can't remember the, the, the leader's name, I, I didn't believe in what he said, but I believed he had the right to say it. And I believed he had the right to live the life he wanted to live as long as he wasn't breaking any criminal laws. And I wasn't convinced he was breaking any criminal laws. But that's an example to me of when the government gets into religion 
If that had been the Catholic Church, the government would say, okay, that's established religion, but it wasn't an established religion, so the government took a, 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 a dim view of it. So my, my thesis is this. This society is not based on God, and we should be happy with that. This society is based on the free will of every person. If you want to belong to a religious society, join a monastery, become a priest, a nun, a minister. I think church is a religious society. Go to the church of your choice. But I hope that you don't disagree with me too violently, that we're lucky that you can go to a church of your choice, and the reason you can is because the government stays out of it. Thank you. Tonight's debate is to be on society is better off adopting a model of creation over the model of evolution, would be my contention. Robert's contention is that by doing so, that would possibly be an adoption of a religious perspective. And he and I would agree that government should not impose a religious belief on its citizenry. And that is the clear distinction between this society and all other cultures. He brought up Islam. And you must understand that Islam believes, as do all other religious beliefs outside of biblical Christianity, that you can change society by a set of rules. That you can do it externally. And so I would agree with, with Robert that government should not impose a religious perspective on its citizenry. It should not demand that you believe a certain religion. And I would contend that Christianity equals religious liberty. When Christianity is applied rightly, when Christianity is applied liberally throughout culture, when it is the basis for law, the basis for ethics, the basis for all that goes on in society, then you do have liberty. It is not a freedom from religion. It is the belief that Christianity makes and encourages liberty for all, even those who choose not to believe in the God of the Bible, not to believe in the Creator. In fact, the first instance that I, of which I'm aware, in which a leader encouraged liberty was Oliver Cromwell in his address to Parliament in 1634, 1654. Here's what he said, is not liberty of conscience in religion a fundamental? So long as there is liberty of conscience for the supreme magistrate to exercise his conscience in erecting what form of church government he is satisfied he should set up, why should not he give it to others? Liberty of conscience is a natural right, and he that would have it ought to give it, having liberty to settle what he likes for the public. Indeed, that hath been one of the vanities of our contest. Every sect saith, Oh, give me liberty, but give him it, and to his power he will not yield it to anybody else. If I am correct, this is the first instance in which an official, a leader, someone in power granted religious liberty to those with whom he disagreed and with whom he was actually fighting a war. You see, it was only because he understood the Bible. It's only because he understood that it's because of the Creator that men can have liberty that we can have peace and prosperity, that we can have goodwill, we can have debates such as this, it is because of the Creator. 
That is the only system that allows for such disagreement. It is not based on, as Robert suggested, the free will of every person. A society can only have freedom of conscience if you start with the basic presupposition that is because of the Creator, that each person has value and worth and therefore liberty for all. It is because of the Creator. Now, do I have two minutes? Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, I would say that it's correct to say it's for the Creator if that's what you believe. I don't happen to believe it's based on the Creator. I happen to believe liberty is a, an essential, or should be, an, it's, it's, a, it's an essential part of man. A man should be free to believe what he wants to believe or not believe. And I don't think you have to believe in a creator to believe in liberty. But I guess we could go around and around and around. This society is based on a secular premise. The Constitution reads, we the people, uh, with the consent of the governed, etc." It doesn't have anything, it doesn't say anything about God. And the Constitution is, is my Bible, that's the Bible I believe in. I think it's a wonderful document that's often maligned by both religious and non-religious people. Uh, but the, the Constitution is based on the will of the people. And if you want to believe that the will of the people comes from a creator, you, you have a right to do that in this country. But if you don't believe that, then you have a right not to believe that. My answer is, I don't know. I don't think that it is, but I don't know. And I would add the, the one co last comment that we have to be careful if we start talking about our rights being based on God, because that's the basis for theocracies. And theocracies historically have led to one religion. And the religion I think is most powerful in this country is Roman Catholicism. And I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned that, one, that if we go down this road where we believe that we have our rights in, based on the creator, that we're going to end up with a theocracy. Thank you. I guess I exceeded my two minutes. It's okay. uh, before I begin, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to, uh, to Bob for accepting the challenge to be here this evening. He knew that he was walking into the uh, proverbial lion's den. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I'm, I have debated Bob on the separation of church and state issue years ago down at the state capitol, and that's why I thought of him for this evening. Um, I appreciate him being willing to come this evening. And I want to uh, encourage you to engage Bob in conversation afterwards, as if I'm going to have to encourage you to do so. <laughs> and I want to encourage you to write down your questions that you might have during the course of this so that you don't forget them during the break. And uh, those questions will be read to either one of us. Um, also, for those of you who are not familiar with what I do, I work for Worldview Academy. It's a Christian leadership training program based out of Texas. I live in Castle Rock, just down the road. If you'd like some more information about Worldview Academy, I do have a recent newsletter that my friend Zach and his uh, cohort here will be passing out to anybody who wants one after this is over with. And also, if you're interested in uh, the debate that Robert referred to earlier, um, I do have, would you touch this, sir? <laughs> Hot off the press. <laughs> right? Am I right? Burn fingers, sorry. <laughs> Call OSHA. OK, uh, there's an attorney here. He'll represent you. You have the right to be free from religion here. No, just to hit. OK. Uh, this just came out two days ago, just got them two days ago. It is the debate that I did uh, about a month, two months ago, 
uh, with uh, Professor Tooley from the University of Colorado, philosophy professor. And I would encourage you to get this and use it. It has a manual scorecard inside. They're, they're available downstairs. Um, you can get that. So with that out of the way, you can check out worldview.org if you want more information about what I do. I'm ready. Uh, this debate this evening is to be on the topic, society is better off adopting an evolutionist model than a creationist model. Now, you and I all, both would agree that ideas have consequences. However, the term better off implies a benefit, which is not merely an advantage, but it is a kindly, charitable act. Now, that's a value judgment which flows from one's worldview. Your worldview is your set of glasses. It is your framework for understanding ideas. And this issue of creation versus evolution is fundamental to a worldview. How you decide the question of origins determines everything else you do. The model of creation basically states that matter and life were brought into being by the living eternal creator that the existence of every system in the material universe is the result of intelligent design, that everything in the universe has a purpose and a function. And I would contend that this creator is the God of the Bible. Evolution, on the other hand, says that all the material universe is a result of chance arrangements of atoms responding to known physical and chemical laws, that life arose from non-living matter and the diversity of living systems is the result of random mutations acted upon by natural selection. These two models, a model is a, is a representation of an idea, these two models affect all of culture. I'm going to concentrate on four areas this evening. The first one would be science. Unfortunately, this debate on creation versus evolution has often been framed as a debate on faith versus facts, or it has been called non-science versus true science. Sometimes it's been called religion versus reality. When in reality, evolution is not science. Evolution is, at best, a philosophy of science. But I would also contend that creation is not science, it too is a philosophy of science. You cannot test either model, you cannot repeat either model. In fact, those who are evolutionists will say the same thing. Just recently, Dr. Eugenie Scott, who's the director for the National Center for Science Education and a very outspoken proponent of evolution, made this statement in the Denver Post. Evolution is a theory. It's much more important than a fact because theories explain things. <laughs> and this echoes Stephen Jay Gould, former paleontologist, leading evolutionist, who said that e every fact must be interpreted in light of theory. The model of evolution has provided great benefit in science. In fact, you might say that science is the daughter of creation. Great scientists who went out and made discoveries in our natural world did so because they were creationists. They weren't creationists who did science. They did science because they saw there was a creator who put order into the universe. And they went out to discover this order. It resulted in tremendous benefits to mankind. These are just a few. In fact, the renowned philosopher, science philosopher, Alfred North, North Whitehead said that the origin of science depends upon the Christian insistence upon the rationality of God. Men such as Joseph Lister, whose discovery of antiseptics expanded the life of countless numbers of people. The lifespans of people have been benefited because of scientists who were creationists. For example, Louis Pasteur put to rest the idea of spontaneous generation, that life came from non-living dead chemicals. That is the linchpin 
That is the keystone of the evolution model, is it not? That life comes from non-living dead chemicals. Even though he put this to rest, even though his experiment still stands in France that destroyed this idea of spontaneous generation, this pseudoscience of evolution still rules the classroom and rules the day. Scientists are in denial. Oxford scientist and author Richard Dawkins said, it is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. Well, I think that's a value judgment, do you not? We must realize that creation benefits all. It is time that we learn to bear the truth about creation, no matter how pleasant it may be. It is only because of the Creator that we can even do science. It is because of the Creator. When it comes to Robert's area of expertise, law and ethics, I would contend that if you start with a model of evolution, then individual worth is extrinsic. The individual only has worth if he can contribute to society. The strong survive, the powerful rule. Arbitrary laws are created by elite rulers. Private property, your mind, your body, and the fruit of your labor is tenuous at best, I would say non-existent. Personhood is defined by arbitrary rules, as are the laws that govern their actions. And the group takes precedence over the individual. In fact, Adolf Hitler made this statement, the individual is nothing, the group, the Nazi party, is everything. When group rights get the upper hand gone are the unalienable rights given to the individual by the creator. If you have an, a creationist model, however, individual worth is extrinsic. It flows from the creator. Laws are absolute and creator revealed. Even society's weakest receive protection, the infirm, the young, the helpless. Property rights result in prosperity because it results in a free market. Personhood is defined by the Creator, as are His laws that govern mankind, and as a result, the individual matters. It is only because of the Creator that we can have law and liberty. When it comes to human relations and public charity, the evolutionist position would be echoed or stated clearly by this man who said, He who does not wish to fight in this world where permanent struggle is the law of life has not the right to exist. I do not see why man should not be just as cruel as nature. This, of course, was Adolf Hitler, a committed evolutionist. If you think I'm imposing an evolutionist model on Hitler, then listen to the words of evolutionist Sir Arthur Keith, who stated, the German Fuhrer, as I have consistently maintained, is an evolutionist. He has consciously sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. If you're going to hold to an evolutionist model, you would have to agree that Darwin's book is very important, it serves in the class struggle in history. This, of course, was Karl Marx. Those are times and countries far removed from us, but the model of evolution being adopted in our culture has resulted in death as well. More children from the fit, less children from the unfit. That is the chief issue of birth control. This person also called certain people human weeds. That, of course, was Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood. You will not see these statements in their publications today. Why not? Because all of us, creationists or evolutionists, would be offended by those statements because we all have in us a sense, innately, a sense of justice. It is because of the Creator. Mass murderer Jeffrey Dahmer said this, if a person doesn't think there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior? That's how I thought anyway. I always believe the theory of evolution is truth. When we died, that was it. There is nothing. It is only because of the Creator that we have individuals that matter. And as a result, hospitals, charitable organizations were founded to honor the Creator's handiwork. Education for all, even poor and women, were there available in order to train the Creator's handiwork. Slavery was abolished by creationists such as Wil William Wilberforce in England because all persons bear the Creator's image. Christian charities and decency resulted 
in a creation, from a creationist mindset. It is because of the Creator. When it comes to the area of epistemology, the question is, how do you know anything? Since everything happens by chance, the individual too is a product of chance, as is his brain. Thoughts become just a random secretion of one's brain, therefore one can never know if what he is thinking is true and accurate. When it comes to right and wrong, without a way of knowing truth, no action or idea can be deemed right or wrong. Therefore, anything is permissible. Evolutionists may have morality, but evolution has none, can offer none. It is only because of the Creator. Which model most benefits society? Evolution has resulted in death. It flourishes on selfishness. As a result, millions have been sacrificed on the altar of evolution. The model of creation celebrates life. It encourages followers to be selfless. As a result, hospitals, charities, churches, schools have benefited millions of people. It is because of the Creator that we have liberty and law, that we have prosperity and peace. It is because of the Creator. Thank you. Talk longer than that. I knew you were going to get nasty. Where do I start? Creation is religion. Creation means that a necessary being, as the Jesuits call him, um, was the founder of everything that exists. And that this necessary being is illimitable, is infant, inf infantes not infinitesimal in a small sense, but is infinite and that this being always existed and will always exist. Everything else is temporary. That's religion. Evolution, to me, is based on science. It may be bad science. It may be wrong. But what little I know of evolution, you see a Cro-Magnon man, a Piltdown man, and there is evidence to draw the conclusion that this species called man evolved over time from something that he wasn't or she wasn't to something that exists today. I don't know whether it started with an ape, because we still have apes. That's one of the things that always bothered me. If, we started, if evolution started with apes, how come we still have apes? But I, I think that the evolution is a science. To me, it's a science that has a lot of gaps but uh, it, it, it is, it's been established by extrinsic evidence. Now, which is better for society? Religion is wonderful for society if you keep it at home and in the church. The, but there's a movement to put creationism into the public schools. That's not good for society. Because the minute you put creation in the public schools, you're putting God in the public schools. The minute you put God in the public schools, which God is in the public schools? Is it your God or is it your God? Whose God is it? Maybe it's your God, but it's not your God. You go down this slippery slope, and you're going to end up in a place where you don't want to end up, which is why this country was founded in the first place with a secular government, that the government will stay out of this. You're free to believe in the creator, and you're free to think that evolution is all by chance and it's wrong, and that's fine. Let the government stay out of it. Your government, let them pave the roads. Hitler, Hitler was a Christian. I don't know if he always stayed as a Christian, but he was a Christian. And the Pope supported Hitler, and the Pope certainly was a Christian. Pope Pius XII supported Hitler's extermination of the Jews. And I'm not a Jew, I'm a, a half Irish and half Italian. So I'm not speaking about the Holocaust like a lot of other people do that, that uh, uh, I'm just speaking up, trying to speak objectively. But the Holocaust was aided and abetted by the Catholic Church, and there's no question about that. The Pope stood back and let it happen. And after World War II was over, the Pope helped some of those people go to Argentina and have uh, a, a place to live where, where they wouldn't be bothered. Where do, where do, we, where, where do we talk about Kings, kings by divine right. That, that's why we have this country, because 
we had kings who claimed they had special rights over, as, by the creator over you and me because they, they, were, they were anointed by the creator and they were, they were kings and leaders by divine right. That isn't, that isn't the case in this country. We're not anointed by divine right. We're all, we're all equal and we get where we get based on our own accomplishments or who we know or any other number of things. Margaret Sanger. I don't know if that, I, I'll have to accept the, the accuracy of that quote. Margaret, I think abortion is a horrible thing. I do. But I don't want the government getting involved in it. Because no matter what you might feel about abortion, there's going to exist, it's going to continue, and all the government will do is botch it up. On the other hand, 30 seconds. I haven't even gotten to where I wanted to get to. On the other hand, why don't we have birth control? Why, don't, why aren't we educating our children uh, so that they have some concept of sexuality and the responsibilities of sexuality? Why do we have, live in a society where, where there's so many abortions? It's because we live in an ignorant society and we need, to, we need to educate the society and we need to give the society the tools to deal with this so we don't have to kill fetuses. Am I, am I all, uh, I'm, I'm finished for the time being. Have there been atrocities in the name of Christianity? Of course, there have been atrocities. There have been wrong judgments on the parts of religious leaders. So all you have to do is pick up the daily newspaper and you can see comments by renowned religious leaders who you may or, not, may or may not agree with. People say silly things. People do wrong things. Just because you're a Christian just because you're a creationist does not make you infallible. But let's look again, not at individuals, but let's take a look at which model better benefits, most benefits society. Adopting an evolutionist model results in death. Evolution celebrates death. Something old has to die out before something new can take its place. Death is good. Evolution is a selfish position. The strong survive, the powerful rule. Those who have promoted evolution in cultures that have adopted evolution, it's resulted in nothing but pain and suffering and death for its citizenry. From Nazi Germany to the Soviet Union to the communist dictatorship of Mao in China to the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia. Just in the past 70 years, over, over 190 million people have been killed. Again, creation celebrates life. We have to choose whom we're going to serve. Is it going to be the God of death or is it going to be the God of life? We have to choose. Yes, government should not impose belief on the individual, but government passes laws based on assumptions. Do I get a little time now? I'm going to talk fast. I noticed in one of your um, um, screen showings, you left out Galileo. You had it in the first one. And why did you leave out Galileo? Because Galileo was placed under house arrest by the church because he said the world was round. Slavery, yes. There were both atheists, agnostics, and Christians who opposed slavery. There were also a hell of a lot of Christians who had slaves. These all things work, these things work both ways. What, what is, is, is creationism? which I will say, I will call Christianity or religion, is it a triumph of, of life over death? Christ died for our sins. 
You, the Christians believe in tribulations, Armageddon, Judgment Day, hell. True Christians live their lives in contemplation of death, not life. The Catholic Church that I used to belong to believes in transubstantiation, actually believes that the host is the body of Jesus Christ and that the wine is the blood of Jesus Christ. Not, not a, it really is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. You are a cannibal if you take a host as a devout Catholic. Amen. That is the truth. That is the truth. Religion, the Salem witch trials. Um, Joe McCarthy. Joe McCarthy was aided and abetted by the Catholic Church, and he set us down a road against communism that cost us trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and accomplished absolutely nothing. But the Catholic Church didn't like communism because it was atheistic. It had nothing to do with uh, our national security. The Pope supported the Peron regime in Argentina when uh, the Nazi regime was, was defeated in Germany. And I read a book recently about Morton Bormann, who was Hitler's right-hand man, and the way he lived in, in, uh, in Argentina and in South America. And the, the Pope was, was, was supportive of that. How about the Middle East? We see in the Middle East, we see religion at the bottom of the Middle East. Israel and the Palestinians and the Arabs and the Muslims and it's all about religion. Iraq is all about religion. We have no business being in Iraq. They've never done anything to us. Saddam Hussein's a bad guy. There are a lot of bad guys. It's about religion. The, the world, if, if you want to, if you, the world is, is the, the trail of blood that follows religion is enormous. Religion can be used by political people to get other people to do things that are absolutely unspeakable. Do I have any time left? Okay. I want to get a little, do a little humor now. I, I, I'd like to. Has, has anybody, anybody here read Letters from the Earth by Mark Twain? Okay. Mark Twain... Um, wrote letters to the earth in the early, shortly before his death, in the last 10 years of his life. He died, I think, in 1910. And it was not published until 1962 because it was so controversial. And basically, letters is the earth as God created uh, the universe. And then he said, what have I done? He sent an angel down to write back about what he observed on earth. And, and it is worth reading. It's humorous. Uh, you might find it a little bit controversial, but um, the angel goes down to earth and he says, I can't believe what's going on down here. These people that you, that you uh, created, they're killing each other left and right, and they have all these diseases. And one, of the, one, of the, um, one of the chapters is about Noah, about how Noah uh, put all the species in his ark, and that included um, the typhoid germs, the cholera germs, the hydrophobic germs, the lockjaw germs, the consumption germs, the black plague, and all kinds of other evils. And when he left, he also realized that he'd forgotten one, a fly, to put a fly on his ark, so he had to turn around and go back and get a fly. I know it's poking fun at religion. Another section is called The Intelligence of God. He made all things. There's not in the universe a thing great or small which he did not make. And he pronounced his word good, work good. The work covers a hold of it. It puts the seal of approval on everything. And then he talks about a fly. I'll just finish this sentence. He says the fly is one of the most hated creatures of God's creation there is. People are always swatting it and killing it. And nobody ever stops to say, this is a creation of God. We should honor it. We disapprove of that fly. I'm going to stop there. and hope, Do I get another two minutes? 
read Letters for the Earth. It's at Barnes and Noble. Um, and the last comment I'd make is that keep an open mind. If you believe in God, fine. But don't criticize, don't, don't be too harsh on people who don't. We, we have a right to be wrong. Thank you. Interesting that uh, whenever you do the dis debates on creation versus evolution, you get into a discussion with someone on creation versus evolution, it leads to the underlying question, and that is, why are we here? Why are we here? This is not a science issue. This is not a science debate. It's a debate on which model most benefits society. So why are we here? You might agree with the composer John Cage who said, no why, just here. You might turn to that great philosopher of science, Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> Dr. Spock who said, I find the question, why are we here, typically human. I'd suggest, are we here would be the more logical choice. <laughs> or you might agree with former paleontologist and leading evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould, who said, we are here because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures. We may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. Robert is right that in the name of religion, there have been atrocities committed. In the name of Christianity, you and I would agree that there have been atrocities that have been committed. It is not a question of, is religion going to be taught? The question is, which religion? Whose religion? Because everybody is religious. Everybody believes in something. Even the person who believes in nothing believes in something. Because he believes in nothing. Everybody is religious. And he brought up a valid question, that is, there, are, there is pain, there is suffering, there is war, there is bitterness, anger, strife, disease. Life sometimes is a pain in the neck, isn't it? Well, let's turn to a great philosopher king who struggled with this very issue. He seemed to reach, at the first blush, the conclusion that everything is worthless. Nothing is worthwhile, he said. Everything is futile. What does a man get for all his hard work? This was the wisest man on record who said, I have greater wisdom and knowledge than anyone. I worked hard to be wise instead of foolish. But the more my wisdom, the more my grief. To increase knowledge only increases distress. He therefore went on to try other philosophies such as hedonism. It's the don't worry, be happy syndrome. Let's just seek pleasure. He found this too was futile. For it is silly to be laughing all the time. What good does it do? He sponsored great public works projects. He built great edifices. He sponsored the arts. He was a patron of the arts, choirs. He said, I became greater than any of the kings in Jerusalem before me. Anything I wanted I took and did not restrain myself from any joy. I even found great pleasure in hard work. And yet, he discovered that he who dies with the most toys, well, just as the fool will die, so will I. I turned in despair from hard work. What does a man get for all his hard work? Days full of sorrow and grief and restless bitter nights. It is all utterly ridiculous because he still dies. In fact, he concluded that the dead were better off than the living. The most fortunate of all are those who have never been born. They never see all the crime and the evil. Aren't you glad you came this evening? <laughs> so what is the point of life? Well, let's turn to that great catechism. And that is, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Why? For everything comes from God alone. Everything lives by His power and everything is for His glory. The wise king's conclusion was this. Don't let the excitement of being young cause you to forget about your Creator. Here is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commandments, for this is the entire duty of man. For God will judge us for everything we do, including every hidden thing, good or bad. You see, life has a point, 
because of the Creator. If you have not considered that this evening, perhaps it is time to decide. It is time to consider your Creator. In fact, if you were to die right now, would you know for certain you'd go to heaven when you die? If you didn't know, and I could tell you in less than 30 seconds that you could, <laughs> would that be good news? May I tell you? Might as well say yes, because I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> let's say that this watch, let's say that this hand represents you and me and everybody in the world. Let's say that my watch represents sin. Do you all know what sin is? It's what offends a holy God. Ever done any bad things? Well, the answer is, yeah, everybody has, right? Yes, if you really knew me, you would not have come to listen to me not, tonight. Because I've done some pretty awful things and I've thought worse. But then again, if I really knew you, I wouldn't have shown up. <laughs> We've all got what? Sin. Our sin condemns us to hell. That's the bad news. Now, I know a lot of people go to church on Sunday. They go do, do good deeds. They go out and feed the homeless, save the whales. Does that take away their sin? No, it just covers it up. Sin cannot be erased by good deeds. And again, our sin condemns us to hell. That's the bad news. The good news is that this hand represents Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, who came to earth in the form of a man. He lived a perfect life. He is God. And he took all sin on himself. Now, if he took all sin on himself, what is there left for us to pay? Nothing. And he paid the penalty for sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. He died a horrible, tortuous, undeserved death on a cross. He got rid of that sin. He proved he was God by resurrecting. He defeated death. And he said that anyone who puts his trust in him, he will give that person eternal life. And how long is eternal? Forever. You see, you can have life abundantly here and eternally. This is not just a temporal question. It has eternal ramifications. As the wise king's father wrote... Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire no one on earth as much as you. My health fails, my spirits droop, yet God remains. He is the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. It is because of the Creator. Because of the Creator. Thank you.